Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Uh, Holy Spirit, I want to welcome you into this conversation. I'm looking for some truth and some flow. Whatever that means, let it grow. So, Mr. Jerry, Jerry Jordan, I welcome you into this conversation. Well, thanks for having me, Victor. Indeed, man, indeed. I love your name, man, that JJ. So, is Jerry your real name? Is Jerry Jordan like your real, real name? Yeah, Jerry. That, that's the full name. It's not Gerald or Jerome. Really? It's Jerry. Yeah. Where'd your parents yeah, come up with that? I don't. I don't know how they came up with it, but um, I hear a lot. Uh, colleagues at work who have young kids, um, they talk about Dr. Seuss. Mm-hmm. Age and Dr. Seuss. One of his books that says Jerry Jordan's Jelly Jar. <laughs> that's and awesome. So yeah, I hear that a lot. Um, that's nice. But yeah, it's it's just Jerry. Wonder if they got in a fight. Uh, uh, no, I want to Tom. No, it's gonna be Jerry. Jerry Jordan sounds cooler than Tom Jordan. Uh, <laughs> so that's cool, man. I I like that. I like that. It just rolls nice. Yeah. Uh, so w- w- uh, so what are you currently working on, man? Well, um, I'm working on a new piece. Um, I actually just started to do the initial sketches for it. And getting my uh, my son and daughter to pose. It's um, it's going to be called the um, butterfly safari. Mm, nice. Okay. And, um, yeah, it's you know it's going to be like thirty by forty oil on canvas, and it's just going to depict um, you know young kids in the in a field, mm-hmm. flowers, um, carrying um, one is going to be playing the drums and one is carrying a butterfly net. And okay. um, it, it's a simple theme, but, it, you know, it's all about freedom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the kids being, African-American kids being free to wander around in a field of fl- wildflowers and, and be themselves. Mm. And not worry about being harassed or arrested or attacked or anything. They're just free to be themselves and explore who they want to be. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. Although, although, you're making me think about when I was a kid running around in the meadows in the fields. And uh, I remember we, we used to run around in the meadows and then there was like this wooded area that we build like forts and stuff. But yeah. on the other side of that was the police station. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so we, we used to sneak out and like jump on top of the police station because it was this weird like, hill that you could actually jump on top of the building of the police station the municipal wow right and so we take off their shingles like (laughs) we like they shingle their roof and then run back into the woods like that we're like we were lost boys or something but um (laughs) but yeah uh running man i miss those running in the fields you know just free like that one yeah Yeah. good days man did did you uh did you grow up uh, anywhere like out where you had fields and meadows or were you a city boy or like what, where, where do you come from? Uh, I'm, uh, well, I'm originally from Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, it's like uh, 20 minutes South of Milwaukee. Okay. Um, it actually is, you know, 20, maybe 15 minutes North of Kenosha where everything is happening right now. Mm. Um, so I'm from that area and um, you know, born in the city. If you can call it a city, Racine's kind of more of a factory town. Gotcha. Um, it used to be a mm-hmm. big factory town. Um, but it wasn't a lot of woods woods in the area. There were some big parks mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Down, there was a river. You could kind of go and play around. But, um, yeah, it was an, 
it wasn't a whole lot of opportunity for me, at least, to uh, roam around in a field of wildflowers. <laughs> And now, uh, do, do do your kids have that opportunity now? Yeah, there, there's a nature preserve not far from our uh, our condo right now. Um, really? That's, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, it, it makes it, you know, you get a lot of interesting wildlife hanging out in your parking lot. Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. of that, you know, wild turkeys and turtles, and you see a fox every now and then. People claim there's coyotes out there. I haven't seen any, but. Oh, I'm sure they are. They're coming yeah. back, especially during COVID, man. Like when everything shut down and people went inside, all of a sudden. I know like, I saw that. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, I saw that. Different cities around the world, you had wildlife coming into the cities. Man, it was like, it was like watching legend all over again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, actually, I thought of that too, yeah. That's cool. So, so how old are your kids, man? Um, I have a 21-year-old son and um, a 16-year-old daughter. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. That's beautiful. Which makes COVID, this COVID situation a little bit more bearable because I, I don't have little kids to uh, bounce on my knee and yeah. you know, chase around after. Yeah, and they're not screaming. But they're, yeah. but they're old enough to have a nice, friendly, intelligent conversation with, too. Exactly. And the heck, to have exactly. a 16-year-old uh, daughter and a 21-year-old boy um, as a dad during COVID, having them forced in your house, you're probably like, woof, I ain't got to deal with nonsense from other boys and girls. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, have co-workers, I have co-workers who, you know, um, when we have our our Zoom meetings, our virtual meetings, you can see their kids running around in the background and try, little kids trying to get the parents' attention. And so I, I feel for them. I, yeah. I know that has to be hard. So tell me one story, man. Tell me one story like that was crazy that happened, if you can legally tell me this story, um, <laughs> that happened on Zoom uh, that you were just like, what? Well, it's, uh, one of the coworkers, she had um, – Actually, it was a guy. His um, his daughter was kind of just running around the house in her diaper, and <laughs> so it was. It wasn't a you know. It wasn't nothing really crazy, but it was just fun to watch. You know, uh, this <laughs> kid hilarious. just running around the house and just kind of like a little wild kid, hair <laughs> flowing in the background, and the kid just running around and screaming and stuff. And 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 I know the. the the father was pretty embarrassed, but we, mm-hmm. everybody was like, hey, man, don't worry about it. This, this, this is a different time. We all have to adapt. Yeah. I'll tell you, man, that, that, that COVID, though, it was harsh. Um, there was a, something that was beautiful coming out of it. And that was, uh, you know, there was, this, there was this beautiful sense of humanity that was coming out of it. Um Yeah. You know, about the third, about two and a half months in, after we kind of got through the, you know, the the panic, and we knew, okay, it's going to be tough, but we're going to make it through this thing. Um, but there was this beautiful return to the arts. There was a beautiful return to, you know, just appreciating uh, humanity again. And um, so I like that story that you you guys kind of rallied around, like, hey, man, <laughs> we all been there before, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I um yeah you're right it was a, a sense of uh, more more of a sense of community um, people coming and banding together mm-hmm. and out af- after each other so yeah that that was fun well I'm not gonna say fun it was <laughs> it was um it was a different experience yeah and unfortunately it didn't last long but <laughs> yeah, no no exactly and it's uh... Uh, you know, we're like, oh my gosh, are we going to move into a new age? Like, where we love each other again? Oh, nope, not really. Um, no, <laughs> not at all. So, so I, I, you know, I appreciate your work. And I was uh, looking at your stuff on Instagram and I, uh, I was like, dang, there's some skill here. There's storytelling here. Um, and as I was looking through your influences and, and what you're producing, um, I, I'm going to say this as a compliment, so please brace yourself. But I was like thinking, man, you you made me think of 
like you're a modern day Henry Oswell Tanner, if you get my drift on that. Yeah. There's something beautiful about that. I was like, whoa, like you, you know, I saw like a, as, a, as an African American classical painter, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I was just like, ooh, you're tapping into a root that, that isn't often tapped into. And, and that's why I reached out to you because, of, so, so tell me about your experiences, man, like uh, your influences, like, because you've got some, some, some mad skills. Like, where did that come from? Well, uh, first, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I take that as a compliment. Uh, Henry L. Tanner was probably one of my first uh, real influences. Um, mm. um, you know, so I went to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater for art. I was an art major. Okay. And that was back in the 80s. And, you know, most wait, of the Wait, 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 wait. You went to college back in the 80s? Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little bit older. How old are you, dude? I'm 54. I just turned what? 54. What? Yeah. How much, how much extra virgin olive oil you eat a day? <laughs> yeah, it, healthy living, man. You know, working out. No, oh, I know what it is. That's that. That's that. that that's that. Uh, that gift that you guys have, right? You look at a 75 year old black man who looks like he's 35, and you're like, oh. "What? You're 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 not 35. You're 78." Like. You know, you guys just got those good genes like that. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I don't know. Um, it's, I would have never thought you were 50. I would have thought early 40s, maybe late 30s. Seriously. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, hey, I, I will take that. I wow. will take that. That's cool. Oh, that's cool. All right, so we're back back in the oh. 80s now. Okay, you're in college. <laughs> it's in the 80s. Wow, yeah, you crazy. know. crazy. All right, man. Uh, time of Howard Jones and mm -hmm. you know, Michael Jackson. Um, but so the school I went to that our program was a really cool program, but it really focused on more of the aesthetics and, um, and uh, what was then modern art. Mm. And, um, and so that was my focus. And um, I never really learned to draw well you know, draw very well mm -hmm. um, until I got out of school and just taught myself. I knew what I wanted to do. I was introduced to John Singer Sargent mm -hmm. and that laid everything out for me. How were you introduced um, to, to, to John? I ran, uh, ran across it in a uh, library. I ran across a book of his in the library. Now this is after you, you, you went to college? Yes. Now, it hold on, after. hold on one second, just for anyone who's listening to this right now in, you know, 2020, think about how pathetic art education is when you go through college and you have to accidentally stumble upon a John Singer Sargent. That, yeah. that, that, that's almost, that's not almost, that is angering, um, so kudos, man, to you for, for, for knowing that there's more and seeking it and then finding uh, that kind of influence. So, so you, find, you find John. We're on a first-name basis, him and I. But. Yeah. Yeah, well, I found John Singer Sargent, and then I uh, was introduced to uh, William Merritt Chase and mm -hmm. Anders Zorn and all the, and that whole crew. And mm -hmm. um, I just began practicing and put in putting in the time yeah um before that when i was in school i was introduced that's when i was introduced to the harlem renaissance and that came as a result of writing a meeting to go to the library to do some research and run it across a section on the harlem renaissance and okay. um, no, educate and that, us on that what, what what is that that is this period of time uh, from the um like eight uh, 19 um, 15 and 1920 all the way up until maybe the early 40s, late 30s, early 40s, where you had this uh, influx of African Americans into Harlem who be um, became the painters, um, the actors, the, um, the writers, um, the sculptors, musicians. Mm. They all converged in Harlem in the mm. 20s at this time. It was just a really, it seemed like it was a really magical time. 
um, because you had all these painters that were there. Um, yeah. You know, you, you had uh, like James Porter, Aaron Douglas, uh, with Augusta Savage, just really, uh, really cool painters and uh, musicians. That's, of course, the jazz age was going on at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you just had a really cool time. So I was just introduced to that. And that was not taught in any other curriculum ever. I never heard of a Harlem Renaissance until I was a sophomore in college. Wow. And, um, I've never so, heard about it until today. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you, and, and like, <laughs> mm-hmm. you heard of like Langston Hughes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, he, he was one of the, uh, the poets of that time. Okay. So I, I've heard, uh, um, you know, of musicians and poets, but yeah. um, in terms of fine arts and the visual arts, like sculpture and painting, um, I know there's a huge community of, of African-American uh, talent out there, but, you know, it's just something that often isn't ever brought up, you know? But, uh, well, check, check out Aaron Douglas. Aaron Douglas um, and Augusta Savage. Yeah, I'm bringing him up right now. There he is. That's cool. Yeah. I got. Uh, okay, I'll take a. Yeah, let me um, take a look at at some of uh, his work. <clears throat> so. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I've yeah. seen this work before. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I was in school. Um, Again, a student in Whitewater. I, I remember asking a professor because um, I wanted some names of black painters or sculptors. And the guy looked me straight in the eye and said, well, Jerry, there just simply haven't been any African-American artists of any note. And, I was, you know, and I'm like, I how can that be? If, if I can draw, and I know a lot of people that can draw really, mm-hmm. they have, there has to be painters somewhere in history. And so um, I was determined to find them, and I found them and stuff. So, yeah, so they became like my um, – they were a huge influence on me because even if the work is different from mine, the style is different, it was the idea that they actually did it. Yeah. They, they became painters and artists, sculptors and stuff. So, yeah, that was, that was part of my drive. And, and, and do you do – you think on them often or is that just like a stage that you went through that they that they affected you or is it something that's kind of like current and con- in your consciousness on, on, on the daily no it's not in it's nothing I, I think about all the time um, I, I think about the drive and determination they had to have mm-hmm. um, and especially in that time when people thought, you know, a black painter, that's not possible. Um, and so wow. I think about that when I'm feeling um, <clears throat> like nothing, you know, like this isn't going to happen. Um, I think about those painters, what they went through. Yeah. So it kind of gives you a, a little more drive. I'll tell you right now, man, Augusta Savage, she is now within the top four of my heroes. Yeah, she, wow. she is really good. To be a woman, to yeah. be black, to be a sculptor. <laughs> yes. I mean, she wasn't just locked away painting flowers, right? <laughs> and yeah. she's sculpting the human figure. And, and to do it at that level that she's doing it, the intelligence, the sensitivity, the empathy, the understanding, not of just the human figure, but the human soul then the command and control over her own being and body to be able to produce at that level and that, that quality. Oh my God. Anyone go look her up. You will drop in, in humility in front of, in front of what you see. Dang. That's powerful. That's powerful. Yeah, she, she's really good. Mm. <clears throat> Man, I wonder what her story is. Well, you know, she was a, she applied for um, an art school, and forgive me, I don't remember what country. I want to say it was either Germany or France, mm. and she was accepted to this prestigious art, artistic academy, and right. when she showed up, 
Oh. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. It was a real problem. They probably thought she was a dude, first of all, with Augusta. Yeah. Well, Augusta yeah. sounds a woman, not a – well, maybe, because I thought it was a dude. But, you know, that's that's what – um sadly, it's just the way history was. But, um, you know, you had people like Josephine Baker, you know, who couldn't make it in the U.S., you know, so she had to go yeah. to France. And, and and the culture was different, and, and they and she made a name for herself there. Um, and that was just – during that time, part of, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. part of the system, you know. Uh, but thank God she got her education somehow and mm -hmm. produced what she, oh, my God, those are amazing. All right. I'm going to stop looking at her stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming back to her later. Okay. But that's beautiful, man. I love that, that you found this. What a gift. What a gift. Yeah. And now yeah. you're part of that lineage, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm working at it, man. Um, like, like I said, at 54, I, um, you know, I, I will say that when I first got out of school, I worked at it. And then, you know, over time, you're hanging out with your buddies. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, then you're hanging out with your girlfriend, who later becomes your fiance. You go back to grad school. And art really took a, a back seat. And then yeah. when kids came along, it took a back seat for a for quite a while, a number of years, a year, no months or a year will go by if I'll be doing really anything. Mm -hmm. And um, and then finally, I, I ran across International Artist Magazine, and I, I want to, uh, I can't think of the name of the painter, but I saw it was like 40 painters under 40. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was like, you know, I'm almost 40, and this kid is like 20, and he is so good. I said, I can do this. And so that kind of really was the start of me getting back into it. And that's been maybe about 12 years ago. Were you motivated? I mean, were you like hopeful when you saw that or were you pissed off? A little bit of both. I, I, w I was more pissed at myself for allowing so much time to go by. That's it, you know, um, but, you know, I don't regret really, it. It's just the way things were. No, know? no, no, no. That's a good yeah. thing. It's a good yeah. thing to have that passion. We, we label yeah. it, right, something, but there's a deposit of energy that, that rolls yeah. up in us, and we can sit there and, and feel bad about ourselves and waste it. Or yeah. we could take it and do something with it, right? And that's yeah, you get to work to. on it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and the reason why I'm asking that question is for anyone who's listening. You know, I had a great friend, uh, Kirill Jelioskov, who once said, uh, we were asking the question, when you look at a great work of art, how do you know it's great? And he says, because it raises me to, it, it, it provokes jealousy, in me. right? And, oh, yeah. And that's, and that's that, that, ah, you get pissed off. Like, it, you know, there's a, a competitiveness. Like, nah, don't let this talent go to waste, you know, like this power yeah. to go to waste. So, you know, that's like, um, I, Man, again, when I was in college, I saw the movie, I think it was Amadeus. Yeah, yeah. And um, there's a scene in there where Amadeus is um, his rival. This other uh, composer mm -hmm. is in his room and he runs across this piece of music that Amadeus is working on. And he picks it up and he starts reading, reading the music and he's moving his hands along to the melody that he hears in his head, mm -hmm. he realizes that he's good, but he would never, ever, ever be at the level of Amadeus. And that was, and that, you know, it really stuck with me over time. Wow. Because I want to be, I, I want to be as good an artist as I can possibly be. Yep. So I, I don't compete with other artists. I'm competing with myself and, you know, well, as you're yeah. competing with yourself, let me let me ask a couple questions on that, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. You know, we just go there. Where, where do you feel that you, you know, to get to that next realm, that next level? What is it that you feel needs the most um, tightening in in your process? Wow. Um, well, I, I will say um, composition. Um, you know, when I was in art school, you know, you had, you were studying composition mm -hmm. and I really found it, I found it so boring. Mm. Um, why'd you I, find I, it boring? What was it about I, it that, that was boring? I don't know. I, maybe it was the way the instructor 
taught it. I don't know. I, f- I found it so boring. But, I, you know, you did, I did understand it, and I got something out of it. But um, I, that's something I always work on is my composition and um, the design of my paintings. Um, I, you know, I have a friend who's an artist, so a lot of times I shoot him an email with a mm-hmm. picture of it, asking, hey, so what do you think of this design here? And stuff, so. Now how yeah, would you articulate the difference between the design and the composition? Because a lot of times people throw, you know, they, they see those words as synonymous. And I'm just kind of curious if you see there's a, if there's a difference between the two. I don't. Okay. I don't. Yeah. I, I think most people don't. They just think they're the same yeah. thing. But all right, cool. Yeah. yeah I, I'm just, you know, you, you're, you're trying to come up with a composition or a design for your painting that's going to be pleasing to the eye, easy for it to follow, that sort of thing. That's going to help you tell your story. You know? Yeah, yep, yep. That's beautiful. So, in terms of now, you, now you, you you primarily paint. Yes. And then what what do you do? Oils. Or, yep, or it's okay. oil paint. So here's a question I've never asked anybody before because honestly, in a weird way, I've never cared. Um, <laughs> but now, <laughs> for some reason, I'm kind of intrigued by this. As a painter, not as an artist, I separate the two. Okay. Okay. But as a painter, as one who's mastering their medium, okay, where, what is the part of your, 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 your medium that you feel really confident in? And then the follow-up question would be, what part would you like to spend a little more time developing to, to even become more confident, more powerful in? And that's not drawing. That's not design composition. Just the yeah. just the medium, the, the mastery of the medium. Wow, that's, that's a good question. Um, that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, well, I, I would say it's um, like okay. So if I'm working on a portrait, mm-hmm. um, I'm trying to get to make the skin. Um, look as real as possible, trying mm. to add depth to the skin. So that is something that I'm always working on to get better. You know, really looking at checking out other painters' work, seeing how they approach, what was their approach, and so I, you know, I do a lot of that. It's really studying um, ways to get more depth mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. to the skin, um, trying to oh, make well, well, it gl- almost glow. Now, when you do that, what resources are you looking at? Because in my mind, I'm almost thinking like there's probably 500 books on, on, and, and videos and courses on skin tone and this and that. But then when you stop to think about, well, they're probably, you know, 98% Caucasian. And if you're doing African-American work, like what, what resources are you going to to help you develop th- that skill with that kind of uh, skin tone? Well, okay, so um, when it comes to just skin, skin in general, painting um, human skin tones, I, um, you know, I had a couple books. I, I had a book, um, Howard, um, um, Howard Sandin, mm-hmm. um, mixing them. I think Raymond Kinsler, Ray Kinsler, I had their books. And so, you know, just practicing the different formulas or mixtures for, uh, for skin. Um, and really just mm. looking at really studying John Singer Sargent's portraits gotcha. and, and other painters, you know, I, I really would study their the work and how they were able to achieve what they achieved in, um, in using the medium. So I study that a lot. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work on, I work at the UW, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And there's a gallery, the Chasen Museum, art, mm. art Museum, right on campus. And so it's like a five-minute walk from my office. Nice. So I can go there on my lunch hour and, um, and just kind of really look at paintings and stuff <laughs> and just really look at the different approaches that people t- have taken when it comes to painting skin um, to get to achieve the skin color tone that they are after. And... And when it comes to African Americans, you know, the books by Kinsler and Howard Sandin, they, they have formulas in there for painting uh, darker skin tones. But really, I, I think it's a matter of 
you have to really develop your eye and do some observation, really observe and practice on your own. Find out the formulas that work best for you. And so um, I really study people Mm -hmm. and observe them. Sometimes they get you in trouble. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, what you looking at? You're on a, <laughs> oh, nothing. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, if you're on a city bus and you know you mm-hmm. see somebody and you're looking at them, and you got to be careful there. But yep. um, I, I really observe people and, um, <clears throat> and look at the undertones of their skin, whether it's you know if I see a gray or olive complexion or a purple or a bluish compl- um, undertones. Mm-hmm. You know, just observe that. And then, you know, I'm always thinking in my head, okay, so how would I paint? How would I paint that? What colors would I use? Mm. So, I, I, you know, all during the day I'm doing that. When I see people, you know, I, I'm, you know, I work with students all the time. And sometimes when I first meet a student or a professor, that's what's going through my head. Yeah. How, would, how would I attempt to paint this guy or this woman? Now, now, do you have a system of notating those colors if you're not – if you don't have a color, like, you know, like a painting palette with you, is there a way that you notate those colors so that you can, when you get back to the studio hours later, um, you, you can remember those things or is it, or you just try to remember them? I, I can remember them pretty good when it okay. comes to, when it comes <laughs> to my art, I can remember very well. Nice. I have a good memory. Um, for other things, no, but for that I do. And a nice. lot of times I will, um, you know, I got like in my office right now that I haven't been in since March because of COVID. Mm. Um, I have sticky notes all over the place where different, um, you know, just remind me mm-hmm. different color combinations. Oh, stuff. nice. So, That's yeah. cool. So, you know, you just grab a scrap piece of paper and just kind of write it down. And, yep. You know, sometimes you may be telling the student, you're just taking quick notes, but you're kind of writing down art stuff. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, that's cool, man. Yeah, there, there are yeah. a couple systems out there. I know I was trained in um, the Fletcher system, but there are, I think, the Mason system. Um, D- David Mason, I think his name was, where <laughs> they actually teach you note-taking, right? Um, notation. Oh. So there's like a symbol system for each color. And so, for example, on a color wheel, if yellow is at the top and you're seeing a color that's yellow, you would draw this little dot, which would represent neutral. And then you would draw a vertical line, which then would be the symbol for yellow. Right. So that would give you the the hue, the color. But then you would ask the question, well, what value is it on a scale, let's say from nine, uh, one to nine, nine being black, one being white. And then you determine that value and you put that little number there and then if there's five levels of intensity, um, you know, the, 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 the circle being neutral, it's a gray. And <clears throat> all the way at the top of that line would be high, high saturation, like bright, burn your eyes out yellow, right? Yeah. So at what level um, <clears throat> is it halfway? Is it 25? Like, you know, wh- what level? And then you just put a line on that, on that vertical line at which of the levels of intensity is. And it's such a very, it, it takes a little time to practice it, to get comfortable with it. But when yeah. you do, you can go out and notate all kinds of colors. Go back to your studio and mix them, like spot on. Because wow. it, it gives you all that information very, very quickly. And, oh, um, wow. Yeah. It's, 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 so there's some, look up the Fletcher color system. Uh, I know you can okay. get the, the PDF for free. You can download it. Um, but, but he has a whole system in there to teach you how to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're ever sitting on a bus or wherever and you see something, you can like, Oh, that's what that just notate that, that thing down and, and you'll be able to play with it. Um, so, so how did you, how did you discover, um, that you were into art? Like when did that happen? Well, I, I discovered that uh, probably in kindergarten, first grade, kindergarten. Now, being that you're such an old, old, old man, do you remember back that far? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Um, yeah, you, you know, kindergarten. Um, so you're what, about five? My parents, I'm sorry? You're about five? Yeah, five or six. 
Nice. nice. I, I remember my uh, my mother came into the school and was talking with the teacher, and the teacher was talking about you know how good I was at drawing and um, that you know my parents should encourage it and stuff. Nice. So, and they did. In fact, um, both I, I have two other brothers, mm-hmm. and so actually all three of us were really good at drawing as kids. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah. And then you do, did you then crush them? And, or do you all are still in the arts today? No, they, they never really pursued it. Uh, my, my younger brother, Gary, Gary. <laughs> I know Jerry and Gary, uh, my younger brother, Gary, he, um, he was an art major, but he was more kind of like graphic design mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, paint, uh, airbrushing. Oh, cool. He did a lot of airbrush work. And then my youngest brother, Edgar, he went into psychology, so he's a psychologist. So, yeah, so you guys are pulled from that that um, that same uh, thread, then. Yeah. You know, years ago, I always look at the artists as the shamans, right? And so, when you go back before we started separating everything, and you condense mm-hmm. it, and you get, you know, you had the the hunters, you had the gatherers, and then you had the shaman, right? And the yeah. shaman was the doctor, the psychologist, the counselor, the artist, you know, the, the, the priest, you know? Yeah. And, and, and so it's this kind of, I don't want to say a spirit necessarily, but there's a certain energy, but then it can find itself into these different types of career paths that we've separated out. But yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, so were, were your parents like, uh, like, when I ask like doctors or lawyers or something along those kinds of, uh, that kind of industry or were they more like, like what, 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 what did they do? Yeah. My, my father was a retired uh, factory worker. He, you know, he worked on at, uh, Massey Ferguson. It was, the, you know, they made a lot of tractors and stuff. Oh yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So he, um, for a while, he worked on the assembly lines, and then he became a maintenance man mm-hmm. he did that for like 30 years and retired. And my mother is uh, was a nurse's aide when she retired at the hospital. Oh, okay, so, okay. Yeah, so I'm the first in my family to go to college. Oh, beautiful, man. And stuff, That's so. That's beautiful. Yeah, my, my family is part of that great migration <clears throat> out of the South in the 1940s. My grandfather uh, came up. Worked at J.I. Case and Racing. Got um, he got recruited to come north and work in the factories and stuff during the war. Mm. Mm. Nice. Okay, got you. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was asking that because um, the Chinese have a proverb, and it was something very similar to what James Adams uh, said uh, many many moons ago, and that was the first generation are farmers and the second generation are doctors and uh, meaning your business people um, and the third generation are artists. And so the Chinese proverb says the first generation are farmers, the second are doctors and the third are musicians. Right. Yeah. And, um, and I just found that interesting that you're an artist and really, you know, uh, when you get into psychology, graphic design, fine art you're, 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 all of them have to really do with the communication of soul yeah right? they do and um but in this idea of the three generations right the first generation comes and works on the farm meaning like they make their living like they express their life through their hands and their labor and then the second but be, but because of that the second generation is built on top of that. And so then they express themselves through um, their, their minds, right? And then the third generation expresses soul. And then there's That's always it. a collapse. Everything's lost. The economy goes up. And then you got to restart the whole thing over again. <laughs> yeah. And so I was just, and so what I find is a lot of times like, uh, people who kind of like a cross, like a cross between the, the artists and, and the business folk, um, you know, the, then they have that struggle, right. In life where it's like, they want to do the art, but they have to also be very practical because they they don't have like the freedom just to do the art. 
you know, and so they have to go get a job or maybe do graphic design or something like that, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I, um, I, I guess I'm still, I'm between the second generation then, um, between the artists and the, um, and the doctor or business. Yeah, that's where um, I am too. So I feel you, man. Yeah. yeah Frustrating. My, my, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my parents were, were happy that I was able to get into college because I was not, because, you know, in high school, I wasn't necessarily the best of students. And so um, they were proud that I was able to get into school and ultimately finish. And, um, and so, you know, you, you have to be practical, um, <laughs> get a job and take care of your kids and, um, I was fortunate enough to actually have a, a really cool job working at the university for the last almost 20 years. Wow, the really? University. So, um, That's cool. Yeah. yeah it, it's a good experience. But at the same time, I, um, I, I'm very happy now to be making art and, um, and actually starting to make a pretty decent um, living off of it and building my name. Yep. getting my name out there and stuff. So now I saw a, a series of paintings that you did that kind of, uh, I didn't know. I was thinking that maybe did you illustrate a book? Cause there was like a series of paintings. Um, there was a girl, like, I think she, she was drumming. Um, yeah. Like in the field. Um, but, it, but, but it seemed like there was like a series of paintings of the same person in the, in the, in an outfit. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a series that I started um, back in wow, at the, right at the beginning of the of the year, mm. and um, yeah, no, they, they were not illustrations. Um, fortunately, they have sold; <laughs> they have all sold. So, so there were individual paintings that you did, or were you doing like a series of paintings? Like, yeah, they were individual paintings um, okay. that became a series. Okay, um, gotcha. I, gotcha. The, the drum, um, the band outfit was actually my wife because she was a drum major in high school. And um, so um, I was so painting awesome. and, I had, <laughs> I, and I needed, I needed a, some type of, um, you know, costume mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for the figure. And I just happened to look up and it was hanging there. And wow. I was like, oh, you know, You're why like, not? Honey. Let's see what I can do. <laughs> yeah, and I just kind of changed the colors around a little bit and, so she yeah, modeled was, for you for it, or did, or did your, or was that your daughter? That was my daughter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's my, cool. my wife, my my wife Naira, she uh, she poses a lot. She posed for quite a few of my paintings. Nice. That's but beautiful, the, the, man. This, this current series, my my daughter <clears throat> posed for me. Man, the tradition of uh, forcing your 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 loved ones to to model for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Somebody should write yeah. a book just on the stories behind, you know, oh, dad again. Um, <laughs> that That is exactly what happens. You want to eat? Oh. Sit in the seat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when I tell them that, yeah, you, you, want, you want your allowance? I need for you to stand right here, very still. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. That's beautiful, man. Um, yeah. so, so is your wife into the arts as well? No, she she's not an artist. Um, she um, she works in corporate America, um, mm. so she, she you know she enjoys what she does. But uh, she's not an artist. But that was one of the honestly, that's how I got her. Of course, she you was know, not she, into she, art. She was into artists. Yeah, yeah. she she liked <laughs> art. She she likes art, and mm -hmm. the fact that I was a painter, it kind of took her by surprise. Oh, nice. Um, and so yeah, that helped. That helped me out a lot. <laughs> that's that's cool, man. That's cool. Yeah. Um. So, what are you looking to do with your art? Like, what's the next step for you, man? Well, I um I recently um became a member of the. Let me get it right here. The Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, thank you. And so I have a representative now. And so um, I think we're in the process of waiting to hear back from some editors and 
you know, soon I'll be editing a book. Hopefully. Editing or illustrating? Illustrating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, well, that's a different career move uh, to edit one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm doing it. I'm, you know, I'm getting more into illustration, but I really want to continue on um, <laughs> doing uh, portraits and um, commission pieces. Yeah. Um, and telling stories with my paintings. If that's, I can tell a story and it sells, and that's yeah. awesome. Yep. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's the key, man. It's It's – you have to be able to tell a story and it, it yeah. can either, you know, be it more of like a narrative story, which is traditionally what you see in an illustration. Um, or it can just be a clear emotional um, experience, but it has to be done uh, with uh, done deliberately. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So if you can't, if you can't trigger a, B and C in a person, and they're not going to pay you if you constantly are triggering, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, <clears throat> so you exactly. have to be able to hit the point, you know, but, uh, here, but here's a little trick. Uh, Norman Rockwell said this, he said, uh, one of the keys to his success as an illustrator was his ability to trigger, uh, two emotions from one image. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. So if you have to do a, uh, so what, well, let me ask you, what, when you hear that, what does that even, what, what do you think that means? I, I, I'm, I'm assuming a sense of awe when the okay. person, the viewer first sees the painting, mm-hmm. you know, they, they kind of like, wow, I, I, that's, that's the emotion. That's not really an emotion, <laughs> but I, I guess the wow does, it is an emotion. You see something, you go, wow, that's really mm-hmm. cool. So there's that, and then um, trying to um, understand what's going on, a, um, a, se- a sense of wonder. Mm. What, what is the artist trying to tell me here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's, why I, that's what comes to my mind. So let me uh, ask you, in the, pa- in the paintings that you do with the drummers, right? Boom, 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 boom. Yes. What if one part of the painting when your eyes moved into that area it felt really really loud like you could Uh, you could see and feel the sound but then when your eyes moved into another area it was just quiet and peaceful well exactly so with that particular painting i am going for that just that sound the way you just described it Mm -hmm. the sound of her playing and just how loud that snare drum is going to be. Yeah. I, I don't play any instruments, but um, I seen the movie Drumline. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> so I know how it, how it's going to sound. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Sound, and so I'm going for that. She's playing. She's out there in that field, um, and there's just nature around her. Yes. And so normally it would be completely quiet outside of the you know birds or bees or whatever insects or squirrels but she has that feel really just kind of lit up with music mm. that, that drum mm. and and there's a sense of determination she's looking off into the distance and and playing yep and stuff now so, what would you do to juxtapose like what's the opposite of that the opposite of her playing yeah huh so the reason why I'm asking is because if you focus on what it is that you're trying to illustrate and you juxtapose it with its opposite, its contrast, yeah. Yeah. Then, then what happens is when the eye moves into the section of the painting that's alive and loud, and then when the eye moves in to the section that's quiet and calm, there's, what happens is the mind, it, it, it becomes like two keyframes in an animation and the mind has to then animate the painting to uh, move from silence to, to sound right mm-hmm. and when you when your mind moves from silence to sound now the painting has created a function it actually came alive and that person has an experience it's just not a picture they're looking at it's an experience because you're shifting one the person from a consciousness of silence 
to a consciousness of sound. And that yes. is what is missing in so much art. And when you feel it, that's why when you look at these masters, look at, I call it a change of charge, right? They strategically put like a set of horizontals in one area and then all of a sudden all these weird diagonals, boom, right? Mm -hmm. And so as your eye moves through there, you, you, you have this switch, this change of charge, which is what Norman Rockwell said, I make you feel two different emotions, right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, but yeah, that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you, man, go back and look at that and like be strategic about it. Like even with your colors, your values, your lines, all of that. Uh, yeah. Put two paintings in one. And uh, so that people can have two different experiences. And when they do, they'll come back and say, man, yeah. this is beautiful. But there's, but there's a soul and a spirit about this pain. I can't put my finger on it. And then you just smile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very it's cool. Nice thing. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so what you're looking to do right now is to move more into getting illustration work and getting into books and things like that? Well, a little bit of both. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to hit all avenues. You know? and, you're, and you're looking to do more commission work. Yes. Yeah. And I suppose that comes from uh, being the son of, uh, f you know, a factory worker and a nurse's aide. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you do what's practical. You find all av any avenue that's going to allow you to do what you love yeah. and bring home some money. <laughs> family so you know i'm just gonna be honest but hey man that's beautiful man i love it yeah so if i if i can do that you know you know do commission work um portraits illustrations i'm gonna do it all that's nice that's nice that's real nice and you know as you get older you know i'm like you know at 54 i'm like i want to i want to be able to enjoy it and mm -hmm. um you know do it before i'm too old and stuff so yeah it's good, hit, hit everything it's beautiful now no your portraits um I, I saw you do a mural what what was the story behind that because that was pretty it was pretty intense man With all those people and the different that you went from the aztecs and there's a there's some navajo in there or something like that it was oh wow you, you went way back huh? yeah and then yeah. and then uh what was that last scene um can't think of it right now. You had like four different scenes in there, right? Like four different Yeah, it was four structures. different panels. The third yeah. one, you have to explain to me. I, I, I wasn't able to uh, get that. I, I, the, the structure, the building of it, I couldn't place what that, what that civilization was or that culture was. It might have been a Pueblo. Pueblo. That, was the second, that was the second one. They so had the, yeah. like the, the, the pyramids. Oh, that's what it was. The pyramids was the fourth one. It was the yeah. Egyptian pyramids, and the the first one was the like the uh, the Aztec Mayan pyramids, and then you had the pueblos, but then you had like yeah. these tall buildings. It was almost like cathedrals, but I wasn't sure what what. Yeah, one was the Great Wall. I had the Great Wall of the China wall. in there. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, the Great Wall of China. Um, Oh, no, yeah, that was okay. Yeah, that was a mural I did for the UW uh, Multicultural Center. Okay. And um, you know they wanted a, a mural that would represent um, Native Americans, Southeast Asians, Americans, uh, Latinos, and um, African Americans. So that was the um, yeah that's what that painting was about. And so it took me like a four four or five months to paint it. Oh really? That's yeah. did, now. Did you do that um, in panels at uh, in your studio, or did you do it there? And then, or did you? I, I did it in pa I did it on panels in my studio. Okay, and then you installed it. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. That's nice. That's always a nice thing. Like, hey, there wasn't anything there yesterday. Whoa, where did that come from? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's and cool. I, I recently did one for the um, for Madison Area Technical College. Uh -huh. um, a new building, at, a new college that they built um, on the south side of Madison. Okay. So they hired um, artists from the community to uh, tell the story of the different uh, groups from that in that community. 
Um, so again, you know, you had uh, Native American uh, painters, uh, Latino, African American. So I was telling the story about African Americans in early Madison and all the way up to current times. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Um, it, it's the painting is called Legacy. Hmm. Hmm. Now, did you um, did you paint yourself in there anywhere? I, I did not. You know, uh, my son said, Dad, you got to do that. You got to. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really thought about it for a moment. You know, see if I could hide my, hide my face somewhere in there. Um, but I, in the end, I didn't do it. Next time you get a commission on that, you could put it in your contract that that's what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the reason why is I'm always asking people this question. You know, a lot of people say, man, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life and uh, what's my purpose in life and blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell them if you're thinking too small, it's not about your life. Right. Think about your great grandchild sitting on the, on the curb with their friend and they point over at say something and say, my great granddaddy did that. And then answer the question, what are they pointing at? Yeah. See what I'm saying? So they, so you have a mural like that and there you are. You're like, that's my great, my great granddaddy painted that. That's actually him, you know, kind of, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, now, you know, the legacy piece, you know, something that your kids and grandkids or great grandkids could actually see, look back on. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that's in my mind. That's yeah. I, I always keep that in the back of my mind when I'm working. Yeah. You know, it's and, just and, something that, and that's, what, and that's why I, I find you to be such a pivotal, important artist right now. That's why I wanted to reach out to you because, you know, and then you bring in the legacy of the whole uh, Harlem Renaissance, right? Mm -hmm. And, and your, you know, and, 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 and your son's like, Hey, put you, put you, put you in there. Right. It, it sounds cool. But in, a, in another way, he's actually tapping into something deep and asking a much deeper request, like make yeah. us known, you know? like, like pass that on, you know? And, um, uh, and so I, I just want to honor you for honoring that man. And like, just being conscious of that reality that's floating through you and, um, yeah, you know, own it, own it because it's not about you. Someone would say, well, why are you putting your face in there? It's like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just a connector, right? I connect all yeah, this history yeah. to that to, to that future history, you know? <clears throat> yep. Yeah, you're right. So if somebody was going to come sit in your studio with you, and they're like, man, Jerry, I really, you know, I love art, but um, how, do, how do I be great? What would you say to them? What advice would you give them? My, my advice would be put in the time. Be mm. prepared to put in the time. Be a little selfish, mm. maybe with your time. Um, go to the library. Go to the museum. If there is a museum, art museum, go. Check it out. Um, take, bring your sketchbook and draw. And draw constantly. Um, that would be my first piece of advice. Study the work of others. Mm. Um, yeah, you, you just have to do that. You just have to do that. I think you really have to put in the time. Um, you know, I, I talk to students all the time who want to be painters or uh, they say they want to be a musician. I said, well, then you have to put in the time. You have to be prepared to put in the time. Um, Bruce Lee has this really, there's this meme of Bruce Lee out there floating around talking about practice. Mm -hmm. It goes, are, are you the best? And you, if you say no, then you need to practice. If you say yes, you need to continue practicing. It's that, that sort of thing. Nice. And so um, that's my attitude about it. You have to put in the time and be willing to learn. You know, there's always going to be somebody that, whose skills are a little stronger and that you can, you know, you can learn from. Mm. Never get so arrogant that you can't learn from somebody. So if I'm sitting in your studio and I ask you that question and you're saying, put in the time. And then I ask you, 
Well, how much time? I would say as long as it takes. You know, as long as it takes until you actually start achieving, you know, you, you're actually getting to the point where you actually feel comfortable and you, um, and you, yeah, you feel good about your work. You, mm. you know it in your own, in your soul when you reach that point, when you're actually pretty, pretty damn good. Mm. That's beautiful, so, man. Yeah, so that, that's you know I'm I'm not competing with other artists. Sure, you have a little. There's always some ego. You mm-hmm. know, look at somebody else's work and say, yeah, I can do that, or maybe I can't do that. Mm-hmm. And if that's the case. I need to talk to that artist, find out what they're doing, or um, or just go back to my own studio and keep working harder. Yep. Man. Oh, so, yeah. That's that's my attitude. So work ethic. Yeah. Yeah. I um I I tell I get up at typically about four four thirty every morning. Nice. To put in the time because I'm working eight hours a day at the university. So and raising a family. Have time to work. <laughs> yeah, and you're raising a family, and that's what it, that's why I started getting up so early because of kids when they were very little. Four in the morning, about the only time of the day you didn't have to worry about a kid coming to you crying or needing something. Yeah. Um, so you get up, you put in a couple hours of work before you actually go to work. You're going to be okay. Yeah. And you need that, especially as a creative, you need that alone time. Exactly. You know, it's um, if, you're, if you're out there and you ever get married to a creative and you're not a creative, um, or if you're a creative and you're going to get married, you, you guys need to have that conversation because to, Rob a creative of that alone time is, 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 is to slowly kill them and they will rebel. And, um, yeah. and so, you know, we, we got to honor your wife for allowing you that time. A lot of, a lot of people are like, what, what, what you getting up at four o'clock? Why, why are you leaving me? Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, but, well, it, yeah. Yeah. Go on. Like, what, what? I, I was just going to say, my, uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate because my wife has never really, giving me any trouble with it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, for example, on a Saturday morning, I may get up at five and work till noon, 11 or noon. Nice. And at some point, you know, she will come to the top of the stairs and say, are you going to come spend some time with your family today? And I know that's the time to cut, start cleaning up and come upstairs. Do you, do you, you lean over to your brushes and say, don't worry about that. She doesn't know what she's saying. I'll be back, yeah. honey. I'll be back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, got two, you got two families. One, one downstairs, one upstairs. <laughs> you know, hey, it's true. It's true. You know, hey, it is because um, it's all about bonds and relationship. And mm-hmm. as an artist, especially if you're starting at five, you know, I, I started at five, right? Around that same age as you. And, um, You've been in a couple more years than me, <laughs> uh, but um, that it doesn't become something that you just do. It's someone you know, you know, and yeah. and and that and there's a bond and a relationship and an intimacy that that goes on in that process, that creative process, and um, and if, you know we we need to be around people uh, who respect it even if they don't understand it and give us the space to do that and it's beautiful that you take responsibility for it and that you get it done in the morning because then you can give you know to your family or to your job or to people that you work with you know and and give because you've gotten yeah yeah you're you're able to get that creative um energy out and yeah and actually make progress on a, on a painting that you're working on or whatever you're doing. You're able to make progress and see progress. And um, it's just really cool. Yep. It's uh, like what I was saying earlier about that shaman, you know, it's, it's that, uh, that creative time is that prayer time in a way. And um, I know for me, you know, four o'clock, you know, anywhere between three and four, I'm up in the morning, unless I go to bed for some reason after 12, then, then, then I can't do that. But getting too old for that but but if yeah. i get to bed 9 30 10 o'clock 
I'm up at 3.30, 3, 3.30, 4 o'clock. And to get that, those couple hours in before the, the world starts, um, it's so crucial. Without it, um, I, I'm just living off of my brain. I'm not yeah. living out of my soul. And when yeah. I live out of my soul, things become so much more enriched, you know. So I, I remember hearing now when I was in uh, grad school, um, it was, God, what's the that class? It was um, history of the Rococo period. Um, okay. <laughs> no, the Baroque, the Baroque. Yeah. Baroque art. And we were studying Rubens. And the professor was saying how this guy had an incredible work ethic. He would get up typically – uh, four thirty, five o'clock every morning, and put so many hours in, in at his studio. And so that's why that's one of the reasons I started doing that. I'm like, okay, this is the well, only cool. time I really have, and and if the, you know, if it will um, put me in the same mindset as Rubens or somebody like that, that's that's a good thing. Yep. Yeah. And. Uh... That's real good, and, and, you know, hey, I'm not I'm not alone when I'm doing it because I, you know, I have my music with me and I'm, I'm listening to um, I, I, when I'm painting. I like listening to jazz. Nice. Um, oh. Traditional jazz with uh, Louis and Ella. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, you know, sometimes you start a painting. I like starting my, my painting session with um, Louis and Ella's version of Summertime. Mm hmm. And nice. when Louis starts out, it starts out with that horn solo. Mm -hmm. That I was like, man, if I can, if I can make this painting make people make people feel the way they feel when they hear that horn solo, I've done something. Mm, that's nice. Yeah, that's nice. I, I I always said like I want my art to make people feel like um uh why can't I think of his name right now. Van Morrison, like a Van Morrison song, right? Okay. And I was like, yeah, I, I, that would be cool. Like, there's, you know, that nice, that that that, yeah. that blues almost like, um, kind of soul. There's a soulfulness mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. So you know, uh, that, that's cool, man. That's cool. So yeah. let let me let me ask you. Uh, one last question. It's going to be the most important question here. <clears throat> okay. So, Jerry, uh, wh what do you like to eat? Man, um, <laughs> I, I will say Thai food. I, I, I love Thai, thai food. food. Okay. Yeah, I, I love Thai <laughs> food. And the next is uh, Mexican. Uh, so, th those are my two favorites. Uh, I just love Thai food, though. Do you cook it or do you go out and, and order it? Yeah, we go out and order. <laughs> Ma Madison, uh, Madison has, I, I don't know if you've ever been to Madison, but it has, uh, has a lot of restaurants. Mm. And um, there's a number of, um, of Thai restaurants around here that you can just get really good food. And, um, and do, I, they, do they deliver it now because of COVID? Yeah, yeah. They're doing a lot of DoorDash and uh, Uber Eats. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, growing up in Racine, the only thing we had was Chinese food. And I never really had Chinese food until I got to college. Mm. And and that was the thing I loved. I just loved Chinese until I started working at the university. And, you know, I'm working around people from Thailand and Vietnam and um, people who are Hmong heritage. And they're introducing me to these different foods. And I'm like, okay, so this is Thai. This is great. Yeah. So, uh, so I've been a fan ever since. And, you know, and then just Mexican food. There's, a really, there's quite a few really good Mexican restaurants here in Madison. Mm. Um, I, I don't know the names of, you know, of certain dishes. But, I, you know, outside of, let's say, enchilada, enchiladas mole, I mm -hmm. love that. And I'm just a fiend for tacos. Mm. I'm a fiend for tacos. You tell me mm. a good restaurant that can make really good tacos, I'm there. Nice, nice. Nice. What kind of tacos? Just like meat tacos, like pollo, like uh, chicken, beef, uh, fish? Fish. 
Yeah, fish tacos. Um, fish tacos I love them. Uh, fried catfish tacos. Oh, that, that, that does not sound Mexican at all, but yeah, <laughs> that sounds super delicious, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there is this uh, one uh, Tex-Mex restaurant uh-huh. here in Madison that introduced me to uh, cat, fried catfish tacos. Mm. And it was, it's so good. There's, um, a, there's a catfish store about three blocks from where I'm at right now. <laughs> I'm so yeah. tempted to go walk on down and get myself some catfish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just really like tacos and stuff. So, And then, you know, of course, your traditional one, I just like pulled pork, spicy pork, mm. steak. Yeah. Have you ever tried Korean food? I have. I have. Oh, and so you don't sound it, like a fan. Well, I mean, it just give you a quick background. So okay. at UW-Madison, there is the campus mall. And during the summer and early fall, you have, um, what, 20, 15 to 20 different uh, food carts. Okay. And okay. so there's this um, this one cart that serves um, Korean, uh, make Korean tacos. Mm. And it's really good. Um, but they don't put enough meat in there for me. Mm. You know? For the amount of money I'm paying, it was just gotcha. wasn't enough, I feel, I feel you, man. Meat. You know, I'm I like, wait a minute, come on. This is all you're giving me here for <laughs> seven bucks? I get two little tacos and stuff. So, yeah. Man, seven bucks. That sounds like a deal. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, well, out here in Madison, that wouldn't be a deal for not for lunch. Two tacos. <laughs> no. no I, I totally feel you. I, I was at this restaurant the other day, and I ordered a, a Cubano uh, sandwich. And and it came out, and it, was, it looked so tiny. And yeah. I was just like, $15 for the Oh, God, right? And... uh but that quickly changed once I bit into it. It was so good, and it felt, even though it was small, it felt so heavy and thick. It was almost like I was eating a steak. And I was like, oh, dang! Yeah. I, actually, I might go get that for dinner <laughs> tonight. <laughs> but Because um, that's actually, uh, I'm on the ninth floor of, uh, uh, of my building, and, um, and it, right at the bottom there's a restaurant attached to the, to the, to the business center here. And... Um, so I, I always eat, <laughs> I'm always eating at that restaurant, but I might I might go get that Cubano tonight. But uh, yeah, yeah, man, can't okay. beat it. Yeah, oh, man, Thai food is interesting. I I, um, I was dating this girl. No, well, I was dating a Thai girl once, and uh, <laughs> uh, and and she made she made good food. But I was dating this uh, non Thai girl who I guess lived in Thailand and learned how to cook Thai food. And, um, and she was cooking it and it was so delicious until she put this Thai like flavoring in that you put in the dish. Uh, and then it tastes like, I'm going to sound really weird when I say this, but then it, it went from, in my opinion, really good to just tasting very Asian-y. I know it sounds very weird to say, but, uh, and I was just like, oh man, no. And it was weird because like without that, 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 that certain kind of flavor to it, it just, it almost tasted like good Spanish food in a weird way. But, um, uh, and, and so she, she loved Thai food and I would be like, yeah, okay, let's, let's have that again. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm fortunate enough to work with um, uh, quite a um, a couple Hmong uh, people of Hmong descent, my colleagues, and mm-hmm. um, and a lot of the Hmong come from Thailand. Um, Hmong, what's that? Um, a, a nationality, uh, ethnic group. It's an ethnic group. Um, they live in China and Thailand and Vietnam. Oh, and really? They, they were, are they, they Mongolians were, or are they something different? Are it's it's something Mong- different. Oh, um, really? It's a different ethnic group. They, um, they live in the, traditionally have lived in the mountains. And they actually were allies to the U.S. during the Vietnam War. Mm. And so um, the U.S. basically abandoned them after the war. And so um, they, the U.S. started bringing 
them to America in um, in the eighties. I think it was the eighties, and they started coming here. And a lot of them settled in Wisconsin. So we, Wisconsin has a very a pretty good size Hmong population. Okay. Wisconsin, Minnesota, and California. Um, and so, um, you know, they, they. So I worked with one of my colleagues. He is a phenomenal cook. Mm. And so he's he's Hmong and was born in Thailand. And uh, oh, wow. the foods the foods this guy brings in for lunch sometimes. He's hey man, you gotta try this and stuff. And um, it has a lot of heat to it. I love the heat <laughs> and, and the spice. Yeah, yeah. So it's one of the cool things about working on campus. You you get um, you get to meet so many different people from all over the world, and you know you get to eat, sample their foods and and their traditions. So it's really cool. Okay, so so I looked them up. So uh, it's H M O N G, right? Yes. Okay. The Mong. Uh-huh. Yeah, they Mong to Mong. the Mongoloid or Mongolian race, and and do so the Han and the other Asians. That's cool. That's interesting. That's very very yeah. interesting. I'm always interested in that because um as as a Puerto Rican, uh, when my daughter was born, she had this weird uh like dark spot on her butt. And it wasn't like necessarily like a birthmark. It was just this weird dark spot. And they're like, oh, it's a Mongolian spot. I'm like, what? <laughs> Evelyn, you got something to tell me. Um, but then they explain like, for some reason, Puerto Ricans and Mongolians have this spot that they call a Mongolian spot. Or sometimes it's almost like this uh, dark, like, like this grayish rash that's on, and not a rash, but like this discolorment of the pigment. Uh, and it just, from my understanding, just happens on the people, you know, the Puerto Ricans and, and Mongolians, and, and they call it a Mongolian spot. So it makes me wonder if our, the Taino, the Indians that inhabited the islands in that area um, were originally from northern China, you know, back when yeah. they crossed over the Bering Straits and came down and stuff. So, to- so let me, uh, uh, real quick, let me ask you a question that. That spot you were just talking about, um, that goes away, right? Well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't uh, looked at my daughter's butt oh. since uh, she was a baby, you know? <laughs> so, but, um, but I do know, I'm going to say no, because oh. I brought it up. I was talking to this Puerto Rican uh, girl the other day. Well, not the other day, about three months ago. And she's like, Really? That's what it's called? Like, she didn't know what, that's what it was called. And she still has it, but it's, like, very big, like, like on her lower back. And my brother, I always thought when we were growing up that he was dirty. <laughs> like, I was like, man, why is he always, why is he look, always dirty there, right? In that one little area. And then, and then you know, I, I was in my oh. 30s and I had my, my kids. So I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Okay. So I'm not sure it goes away. Uh, it might. I don't know. I should do some more research on it. But you know, the the, the reason why I asked because, um, like, when my son was born, mm-hmm. um, we took him. Uh, I think it was like a month later. We took him in for a physical. You know, the doctor was examining him, and um, and he had, um, you know, kind of like a spot on his arms and um, legs, hmm. uh, several spots. And the doctor said, this is very common with darker skinned people, African-Americans, Africans, they, you, you see this a lot. Mm. And sometimes if you get a nurse, you know, a white nurse who mm. um, don't know this, parents, yeah. uh, parents have actually had um, child protective services called on. Yeah, yeah. Um, because he was saying mm. the child had been abused, because I guess it could look like a bruise. Y- yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and so, but of course, it went, you know, it went away, you know, as he got older and got darker, his skin darkened, um, it went away. So, let me ask you a question, kind of similar in that vein. I, I, what I'm going about to ready about ready to say, I, I don't want to come off ignorant, but I, but I think it's the truth because some nurse told me this, right? And I don't know if she was just pulling our leg and joshing with us or not. But when an African American baby is born, are they do they tend to be like, like 
I don't want to say white, but like very pale and then they get their color or do they come out like, you know, like, like black? It depends. All right. It, it's a, yeah. Some <clears throat> come out much lighter. Um, the complexion may be much lighter. Okay. Um, and they're, a lot of times you can tell by the uh-huh. finger, uh, by the ears. What do you mean? You know, you can, make, you can look at the ears and tell what will probably be their true skin color eventually. Really? Oh, so the yeah. ears come out darker than their body? Just the tip of the ears, somewhere around the really? tip. Dang, that's you so know. cool. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a, it's like a black-tipped shark, but it's a black-tipped human. Um, uh, well, I'm sorry? I said, you know, like a shark, a black-tipped shark or a, black, or a white-tipped shark where the, the fin, just the tip of the fin is black or white. Um, but then their bodies are gray. Uh, oh. so, so I'm like, hey, man, that's, that's, it's so amazing how, like, <clears throat> there's so much that goes on, like, with, the, like, you know, with anything, but just, we're just talking about human babies. But, like, yeah, that's, that's interesting, man. Yeah. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. So the, the, the nurse said to us, um, she's like, <laughs> it's sad sometimes, a lot of times, dads, uh, like African American dads, when the babies come out, they get pissed because <laughs> they're expecting that you know a, a black child to come out and it's like a white child, right? <laughs> and and, the, and oh. then they have to explain like no 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 that's just the way the, the way it happens and then you know the pigment comes in, but um, yeah, yeah and uh, yeah, some, so, yeah it all depends on the baby. Sometimes the pigment isn't the, you know the the melon hasn't been released isn't all there yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the baby will darken. For the yeah. most part, will probably darken. Wow, that's cool. That's so neat how all that stuff works. Yeah, yeah. Um, very, very cool. Well, uh, I wanted to open it up. Uh, I know I didn't ask you uh, this this question, but um, in terms of your art business, um, is there anyone that you'd like to, you know, two or three people you'd like to give a shout out to and just thank them for helping you in this process, you know, support you, you know, um, I know you mentioned that you're you're in the uh, society of uh, the writers and illustrators, um, but is there any anyone else or anything else that you like to just take a moment and honor? Yeah, I guess I, I would like to give a shout out to uh, Gallery Gouchard mm. in um, in Chicago. It's mm. in the Brunsville district. Um, really cool people, really cool gallery. And cool. um, then there's a gallery, uh, Mars, Marzen, M-A-R-Z-E-N, here in Madison. That's been really cool, cool to work with. And, nice. and finally, uh, there's a gallery in Milwaukee, the uh, Portrait Society Gallery. Nice. And, and do, you, do you have any work currently in those places? I, actually, I do. Yeah. Nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, so I, I know you wrote that and I put those in the show notes. And so people can go and research those galleries. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Uh, Jerry Jordan, how can people get in contact with you? Um, you can just email me. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm at um, purplehood2 mm-hmm. at gmail.com. Or you can um, message me. On Facebook, uh, just Jerry Jordan. You'll find me, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm on Instagram, Purple Hood too. Cool. So I'll add there your, your, a link to your Facebook and a link to your Instagram. Yeah. Um, uh, and also your website. I'll add that to the bottom of the notes yeah. as well. All right. And one more. Can I just get one more shout out? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Black Art in America. They um, they actually have sold a couple of my paintings, so I can't forget them. Oh, Black Art in America. That's yeah, cool. they're they're located in uh, the D.C. area. Oh yeah, there they are. I'm gonna go to the or website. Is it D.C.? Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see here, Black Art in America. Oh, very cool. I'll go ahead and put that link in there too. Just uh. Um, oh wow! We got some beautiful work here, man. This is like yeah. the this is like the modern uh, Harlem Renaissance. Yeah, you know. Oh, that's great! I love it. Love it. 
I'm definitely going to pass this on to uh, one of my students. Um, he's I guess about almost 75 now. And um, he's doing these beautiful, beautiful uh, relief sculptures. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah. And um, uh, so I want to send this off to him and so he can reach out to these guys and connect with them. But uh, Jerry Jordan, it was so cool to meet you, man. I love your work. Uh, and I just feel uh, honored and humbled to be able to sit for an hour, hour and a half and just chat with you about art, life, and food. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it, Victor. Thank you. And, and you know what? I, I'm looking at our names here. Jerry Jordan, Victor Vargas. That's cool. That's right, right. JJVB. Yeah, <laughs> JJ. That's how Very we roll. Cool. Yeah. <laughs>